So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Scott Zeger, and I'm a professor uh, in the Department of Biostatistics in the Bloomberg School, and I'm delighted to visit you in uh, further west Baltimore relative to the other, other building. And uh, it says this is no longer something. So uh, I'm here to represent the, the Johns Hopkins Individualized Health Initiative, or what we like to call Hopkins in Health. We would have called it just in health, but somebody already uh, has that name. Uh, so we're Hopkins in Health. And um, IN stands for individualized. And something else, if I could advance this, let's see here. So by individualized health, really what we mean is intelligent use of health information to individualize and integrate healthcare. And this, this project actually started as a signature initiative of the campaign that Johns Hopkins is in to raise $4.5 billion. And uh, 300 million of it is to be raised to support the kind of initiative that I'm going to describe for you very briefly now before I introduce our speakers. And um, we started out as a genomic health project. We wanted to ask how could genomic information improve public health, nursing, and medicine. And what we realized after about two meetings was that the best way to get ready to make meaningful use of genomic information was to start, use, start using the other information like age and sex and things that ought to inform the practice of public health and medicine. We ought to use that information intelligently. And we realized then that probably over the next 20 or 30 years, genomic information will never have as much impact as the appropriate use of the existing information about phenotypes and biomarkers and other things that have been around for some time. And we really need to use all information, whether it be traditional or genomic or epigenomic, et cetera. So this project is really about using information to transform uh, healthcare and healthcare systems. And um, I just want to, I, I, I can't not show this slide when I get to talk to a group of 20 or more people. And on the left shows uh, uh, the annual per capita costs for the 34 OECD countries. And America, obviously, is the most expensive country. You can see we're now, this, this was back in 2010. It was about 8,000. We're closer to 9,000 now. And in fact, we just passed the $3 trillion mark on healthcare expenditures. And if you, if you could somehow snap your fingers and make America the second most expensive country per capita in the world, that would be Norway, rather than the first most expensive, the difference in the expenditures for us would be a trillion dollars a year. A trillion has 12 zeros, right? And, and um, so a, a trillion dollars is 6% of the GDP of America. So you think about the problems that exist in America. If you had 6% of the GDP to reinvest in them, you could solve a lot of problems. And that's the difference between us and the second most expensive country. And you'd say, well, that's OK, because we're, we, we're, we're people who love health more than everybody else in the world. So we're investing in better outcomes. But on the right here, you can see that we're sort of in the, um, the developing uh, developed countries as opposed to the developed countries with respect to most of the indicators of, of health outcomes, in particular this one, years of life. So um, that's the context. And, and actually, let me just go back to say that in some ways you could think of this as an opportunity, because to create a more affordable health care system in America would free up enormous amounts of revenues. And those revenues could be uh, invested in solving many of the other problems that we confront. So that's the opportunity, and lots of people want to be part of the solution. Johns Hopkins wants to be part of the solution, and that's really what our initiative is about, along with all the others here who are working on those kinds of problems. So um, one of the ways that an academic health center can become part of the solution is to become a learning health system, and we're going to hear more about that today. Um, but by a learning health system, I really mean that as you conduct, as you, as you engage in the conduct of Healthcare. You really want to learn what works and what doesn't work and what adds value as opposed to just volume of healthcare. 
And we've thought a lot in, in health about what's unique about Johns Hopkins. And from the very beginning, Hopkins has been about more carefully phenotyping, more carefully characterizing patients in a more nuanced way to provide better care. So really, uh, to be a learning health system, you have to embrace the variation among patients and in their treatments and use that as a natural experiment to learn what works and what doesn't. Uh, and, and then to figure out how to subset people and patients to be able to create homogeneous subsets that ought to be treated more like each other and different from other subsets. So if you're trying to do that, there are a number of core skills you need. And I've listed some of them here. We've had, and we've had in health uh, seminars about each of these. You need bioethics to decide what's the responsible way to manage a population's health and to be able to use data generated by care to be able to improve health for people who come after the ones in the system now. You need better data systems to be able to capture what we do and what works and to be able to learn from it. You need new uh, and more interesting designs of clinical studies and analyses to be able to not just say this treatment works on better, better on average than that one, but rather to be able to say this treatment works better in that subgroup of people, but not as well in this other subgroup. So new ways of thinking about it. And really, most importantly, you need business models, but most importantly, you need to be able to change the culture of a health system like our own so that we embrace variation, we learn to subset patients, and we learn to learn continuously from our practice. So um, one thing I want to say about Johns Hopkins be before we go on, it's really unique as a health center in that it represents all three boxes in this diagram. At the bottom, we have outstanding basic science uh, and data science. And when I say bioscience, I mean also the biology, both biology and behavioral science and policy science, the core disciplines that are necessary on which to build a health system. We also do clinical and public health research, and then, of course, we do population and patient care. And in-health is really trying to make it easier for these groups of people to talk to each other, to come together to try to solve the problem of making, getting greater value from the investment of our health dollars at more affordable costs. And the, the learning health system, which many of you are expert in, is really trying to characterize how to integrate clinical research with patient care, public health research, with population health care. I think what really informs Johns Hopkins and makes us somewhat special is we really can bring the basic disciplines to bear on the methodology for the learning health system, what we're, which is what we're going to hear about some today. So this is the uh, fifth in a series of seminars uh, that, that talks about those core elements. Um, we had a seminar giving an overview about bioethics, about data systems in this room, if you remember, some of you, about organizational models with Earl Steinberg from uh, Geisinger. And, and I'm really pleased today to have a talk which is generically about culture change, but you'll hear more about it in just a second. And um, we're very uh, honored to have our own uh, Peter Pronovos speaking to us today. Peter is a professor of critical care medicine. He's the senior vice president of Johns Hopkins Medicine the founding uh, director of the Armstrong Institute for Patient Safety and Quality, um, some other things, but most importantly down here at the bottom. I want, I want to say that, that the New Yorker did say he saved lives. I think it said thousands at a time, but I, 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 just because it's public health, I put millions there. And uh, I think he said they've, he saved more lives than all of the doctors in the history of medicine or something like that. Uh, but but I, I also want to point out that he was the second best student in the 1998 Biostatistics 623 class. And, and the question I have for you is, who was the best student in that class? I have a question for you, Peter. Who was the best student in that class? You better get this right. <clears throat> Her first name is Marlene. His wife was the best student in the class. And I used to notice they sat together in the class. And I was always a little concerned that Peter was looking at her paper. But uh, uh, that, that's not true, Peter. I was like, she always finished her tests in about like 20 minutes, and he would go out 30, 34 minutes later, right? So, oops. So um, anyway, Peter, thank you very much. Uh, hold on, wait, one more thing. And, and then uh, after Peter gets done with his presentation, uh, we're very fortunate to have our own Laura Morlock to lead you in discussion. She'll make some remarks and then lead the discussion. 
Uh, Laura is a professor and associate chair of health policy and management and the school's associate dean for education. As you know, she's a sociologist of organizations and has been a real leader in thinking through how to, how to build quality healthcare systems, learning healthcare systems. And I had the honor to work with her uh, as she, when she would, became an advisor to the Taiwanese government as they were uh, building their own uh, um, single payer system. And it is certainly true, she saved lives millions at a time in building that system. And she's a real innovator in public health education. So with no further ado, Peter, uh, thank you very much. Oh, perfect, you can bring it up. Thank you. It's a little bit daunting giving a talk with uh, the two professors who fundamentally are driving while you're standing here, and Laura in learning the management sciences, and Scott in, uh, in um, the biostatistics. What I'd like to share with you today is really support for why I believe this in-health vision is the way to go. Uh, not uh, because it's a neat idea, but it's frankly the only thing that has worked. But to challenge us to move beyond what I might say being a learning health system to what it requires to be an improving health system. You see, in my role, I have the ability to wear two hats. And one hat, I could be curious and think like a researcher. In my executive hat, I have to be committed and deliver results. And trying to link those two is often not an easy task. And so we'll share with you the journey that we've been on in the Armstrong Institute to be a, a, a learning or an improving healthcare system. Now, in background, <clears throat> if you're looking for some action-packed stories, uh, philosophy is not where you'd start. But as philosophy goes, Perhaps the most action-packed story happened in 1946 in King's College, Cambridge, on a cold night in a dark room known only by its marking on the campus map as H3. On that night, in that room, two of the most influential philosophers of science of the 20th century came to debate. One of the philosophers, Wittgenstein, said that science doesn't need to lead to answers, that all that's important is the questions that you ask. You don't need solutions. Karl Popper was the other philosopher. And Karl came to debate Wittgenstein. Popper believed that science should guide us to solutions for real problems. And he said that we need to measure the value of science by what their impact is on lives and, and, and productivity. Now, the action part of the story came because Popper or Wittgenstein got so incensed, he chased Popper out of the room with a hot fireplace poker. And, <laughs> and the, it's about as action-packed as philosophy gets. But the point of the story is that this the choice between basic research and applied research, or I might say between operations and research, is a false choice. There's a great book kind of highlighting this by Donald Pastor called Pastor, I mean by Donald Stokes called Pastor's Quadrant. Uh, a follow-up article in the, in the Atlantic also describes this. But some of the examples, if you think of Pastor, what did he do? Well, he started out solving practical problems like why milk spoils. And these led him to breakthroughs in basic research, really basic basics like understanding vaccines and bacteriology. But those theoretical issues wouldn't have been solved if he hadn't been trying to solve a real problem of milk spoiling, or in his case also wine uh, spoiling. He also invented crystallography because he, he looked at that the structure of molecules weren't enough to explain how they performed. But all along the way, he had this interplay between basic and applied research. Kennedy, as you know, sent us a man to the moon, not only because it was hard, but because of the great basic science that would come from that. The man moonshot gave us technologies like the CAT scan, the microchip, or more common things like cordless tools, smoke detectors, and even the sole of the modern running shoe all came out of this mixing of pure and basic uh, research. And one more example of the power of this came from uh, my discussion with Gordon Moore. And perhaps the most powerful example in all history is Bell Labs. I was fortunate enough, at, actually with Alan, uh, um, <coughs> with Alan to have dinner with Gordon Moore about a year ago. 
and he described this amazing uh, incubator at Bell Labs where they found the transistor. And as many of you know, he, that transistor then went on to lead to Silicon Valley and venture capital and all the IT stuff that is going on in the Bay Area all grew out of this Bell Labs. But he described that what happened at Bell Labs wasn't that the theoretical scientists found something and then handed it off to the basic researchers. Not at all. Their magic was they created a mixing bowl where they mixed these people together, metallurgists and mathematicians, right? The physicists and engineers, all working to solve problems, but all also advancing b basic science. <clears throat> now, history has shown us over and over again that the engine of progress often runs best when we bring applied and basic t together or you could think operations and research together. But that's not how our siloed model of medical research in America or the world exists. And you may not be aware of it, but the evidence that informs our current model of research is pretty flimsy at best. It grew out of a 1945 report um, by Vannevar Bush to President Roosevelt called Science the Great Frontier. And in that report, he postulated a, this linear model that first you do basic science, then you do applied research, and never the two shall meet. And no doubt that has led to some discoveries, but nowhere near as much as possible. And if you peel the onion and look at the great breakthroughs in medicine, they didn't at all use those in that linear model. They solved problems and they solved, they solved puzzles. So I think what we need to do as a healthcare system is to say, well, could we approach this issue in the same way as Bell Labs, that cultivate feedback loops between theory and application and put teams together on the same project that they can start with the goal and work backwards as uh, <clears throat> our APL colleagues have taught us. Because I believe that we need to rethink this mantra about being a learning healthcare system. Learning's important, but in my view, it, it's incomplete. It, it's not enough to acquire the knowledge. It's not enough to only be curious. We have to commit to realize improvements, that we need this model where the pa practical feeds the theoretical, the theoretical feeds the, the practical, and we're constantly drawing on this diverse expertise. So how does that work in practice, or why might we be here? Well, though we do miracles in healthcare every day, Preventable harm is the third leading cause of death. And that money that Dr. Zeger said we waste, that trillion dollars, to put it into context of our neighborhood, that's like a tax of $9,000 on every family in America that you might as well just burn. A any guess what the median income of the people we serve in East Baltimore is? It's around $11,500, right? So that's money that can go for STEM or preschool or any of these families living their own American dream that we might as well be burning. And we need to be committed to, 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 to do that. I'd like to share with you how we're starting to do this through some of our work at the Armstrong Institute. <clears throat> and that story began very tragically when a little girl died about 2000 year, or 2001 on a snowy night. She had been burned and the clinician saved her, but a central line blood stream infection sacrificed her. And her mother came to work with us and said, Peter, could you tell us that care is safer now? Because she was really worried that how this daughter died might happen to her other re remaining daughters. And at the time, our rates of infections were sky high. Um, and we couldn't tell her, but we said she deserves an answer, and we did. So we created a mixing bowl. We mixed basic and applied researchers, many of them from the School of Public Health, some from Whiting, some from APL, to come together to solve this type of problem. And what we did was first solved it here and then dramatically spread it across the country, now several countries. So these infections, which by the way, kill or used to kill as many people as breast or prostate cancer. So that's kind of the scope of the public health problem, are now virtually eliminated. I wish we had many other examples of redu reductions in harm across the country. Unfortunately, we don't. But what this gives us a glimmer of hope for is to say, we now know we could take one harm and eliminate it from virtually every hospital in America. 
And when we looked, we partnered with some of our anthropologists who are really key parts of this mixing bowl team or the, the qualitative researchers and said, what was magical about a hospital that got to zero? Well, what we went in to interview hospitals, what we found that there were some pretty key characteristics. Hospitals that got to zero declared a goal of zero right from the CEO or the board to the bedside and everyone knew where they were going. Hospitals that got to zero created an enabling infrastructure, their own version of a mixing bowl where they provided people with analytics and project management and improvement science. But importantly, hospitals that got to zero engaged frontline clinicians and they connected them in peer learning communities because what we found was that the power to improve wasn't at all from pay for quality or public reporting. In other words, it wasn't from coercion. It was from inspiration and mobilizing. And that's how they, how they drove change. Not that we don't need those accountability mechanisms, but they pale in power compared to tapping into professionalism. And they had transparent reporting and transparent uh, and, and accountability. So the Armstrong Institute grew out of this vision of could you combine a research group and also be responsible for our operations to begin to be that enabling infrastructure for a learning healthcare system. And we felt pretty good after reducing those bushman infections until I met the mother of this little girl. The mother, Lenora, came to me and said, it's great that you can tell Sorrel King that her daughter's less likely to die now. It took you a decade to be able to tell her, but at least you can tell her. But my daughter died a decade ago from elective surgery. She had pain medicine infused into her and she was getting too much until her breath, she stopped breathing and died. And it's just as likely to happen today and indeed happens thousands of times in America still. Why doesn't she, why don't I deserve an answer? And so we scratched our head and left and said, okay, we've known we could take one harm and lick it from all hospitals. Could we create one academic health system that seeks to eliminate all harms? A pretty bold uh, move. So we formed the Institute with a very clear purpose because I learned from my APL colleagues, Alan Ravitz, that if you don't define a purpose, you can't create a system. So our purpose is pretty clear. It's to partner with patients, their loved ones, and all interested parties to do three key things to end preventable harm, to continuously improve patient outcomes and experience, and to eliminate waste in healthcare. And we're guided on that by some key principles. And again, this organizational things are Management 101 that Laura told me, but they're not things we apply very often. Now, in picking these principles, we went and asked about 200 people, what are the values of Johns Hopkins Medicine? And how many people do you think were able to name all eight of them? Zero. So if you believe in principles-led organizations, it clearly wasn't driving us because no one knew what they were. And so we couldn't call them values, we called them principles. But we said, if you are going to take this bold task, achieve this purpose, how are we going to have to behave? Because behaving the old way isn't going to get us there. And these are perhaps atypical for an academic organization. They are, I am humble and curious. I respect, appreciate, and help others. And I'm accountable to continuously improve myself my organization, and my community. And these principles literally govern how we manage, how we do our work, and they're principles by which we both hire and fire for. Now, in setting this, this is the operational side. We'll get to the, to the research later. We said if we're going to be an improving system, that we got to get out of this loosey-goosey stuff of quality, it's just about stories and rah-rah, that we need to make sure that our board quality committee functions with the same discipline and rigor as the board finance and audit committee. So any of you have ever been on a board or sat on a board, you know there's a P&L statement that goes up to the board and everyone's held accountable for it. And if you miss your mark, something happens. In quality and safety, despite third leading cause of death, we tell good stories. We hardly ever talked about the bad stuff. And if we did have bad stuff, there was no follow-up or accountability so we sought to change that. And here's some of what we did. First, we said, okay, we need to have line of sight oversight for quality and safety, just like finance from board to bedside. That, that is, anywhere care is delivered in our system, it, the quality and safety oversight needs to funnel up to a board committee. When we started this, this didn't exist. We had 
eight ambulatory surgery sites. They never met together. They each had looked at their own data. We had a large primary care through JHCP. We had an academic primary care. They never met, no reporting up of quality. We had six hospitals. They looked at their quality, went to their board. Nothing ever, ever went uh, centrally. We also said we need an explicit accountability plan just like you have for finance and the patients and families voice needs to be in, in, in included in this. So here's an example of how we organize the delivery system for a board thing. And you could argue this is the right way, but we grouped it into hospitals, pediatrics because they had their own measures, population health, home care, international ambulatory practices and ambulatory procedures. Each of these was then assigned a chief quality officer who was tasked to say, create a table where anywhere care is delivered under this area that you have agreed upon quality measures and they report up to this board. You know, give an example. So we've realized we were doing ambulatory surgery in eight different places, never talked, no common information systems. Same for, for ambulatory practices, very different groups were, were, were never aligned. And so this, as you can imagine, the technical part of doing this was easy. The cultural part about getting buy-in was really, really hard because the politics of who owns this and who's going to be in charge, we'll, we'll talk about later how we, we did this. We also modeled the reporting of quality just like we did for finance. So our finance, to give you an example of the discipline, we have this thing called the 8th, 9th, and 10th workday. And what that means is the 8th day after the month ends, each local entity, so the primary care group or the hospital, reviews their finances. The next day, that is met with all of Johns Hopkins Medicine, where they review it. The following day, it's reviewed by Mr. Peterson, the president, and then it goes to the full board committee, right? And nobody would dream of not hitting their data marks of having our data. When we looked at our quality reporting, there was absolutely no discipline, truly no discipline. I, we give it some time uh, because we often have this mantra that, oh, this is data for quality improvement, not research. And that gave people a license. I think it's been the most destructive phrase for improving quality and safety because it gave people a license to not be accountable or disciplined. And the data doesn't know that it's for quality or research. But if you're making public statements or you're responsible for quality and safety, we need to make sure that the data is accurate. We created a, a, a fairly robust leadership system. And what we found is that we were often missing some basic concepts of leadership and management in driving this, but also some transformational leadership. And Mike Rosen and Sally Weaver have been leading a lot of this work, but let me fundamentally share with you what two key types of leadership that they, we put in place. One is that we'll call relational leadership. That is what we found is when we wanted to create, hold someone accountable for delivering something, we often didn't first impose obligations on ourselves as leaders to maximally set them up to succeed. So I would go to a surgeon and say, or in the past we would go, hey, why are your infection rates high? And they'd get pounded in front of the board. It was a shame and humiliation until the surgeon would come around and say, or the department chair, Peter, I have no idea how to fix this. I don't get data regularly. Help me improve. Don't just shame me in front of the board. So we set up a model to say, we will only hold people accountable if we first hold ourselves accountable. And that is, we know the goals, they're cleared and the measures, we give you the data, and we create this enabling infrastructure that you are set up to improve. And if we do that, then you're on the line for improvement. But if we don't do that, then uh, the leaders are on the line. We also migrated to what, you, what is more called transformational leadership. And that is creating this mutual sense of responsibility, contribution, and control, literally cascading down accountability and using language that seeks to inspire and mobilize rather than persuade and coerce, right? And that was a bit of a culture change for us because we were very much focused on this model of command and control from, from finance, but if we were gonna tackle this learning or improving system, we literally need to mobilize and inspire every one of our employees to get out of this. And it's a very different way of communicating and using language of power with rather than power over people, of doing things with rather than to people, and a, a whole different mindset that we had to switch to. So here's this metaphor that we said is literally just like in finance, you could name who's responsible from board to bedside. Could we name the same thing or not? Could we? How do we build out this cascading uh, uh, structure? 
We needed to make sure that we as an organization had mechanisms to gain consensus on, declare and communicate goals. Because what we found is if you're a bedside nurse or doctor or working in a clinic, they often had no idea what our goals were. They certainly didn't have input into it. We had to be driven by this purpose that was guiding all of our work. We needed a infrastructure to build capacity because we didn't have enough people trained in these skills to lead this in the scientific way that, 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 that all of you are trained. We had to make sure that our leaders created trust and respect and that we created a culture where people are able to speak up and speak out. And that comes from leaders asking humble questions and building trusting uh, re relationships. And then we had to make sure we had a leadership development plan. So we had a pipeline of leaders. Now, we're in nowhere near maturing all of this, but we're well, well along the way. The final thing is we use this metaphor of a fractal infrastructure. So how many of you know what a fractal is? It's, they're perhaps the most elegant structure in nature. It's this idea of biomimetics, and there they are, and some of, you, some of you may know these as Mendelbrand sequences. They're structures that have identical size but varying shape structures in a repeating pattern. So think of a snowflake or a fern. But what they allow you to eloquently do is to create an organizational structure that balances independence and interdependence allows you to tap into linking people horizontally for peer learning, but also vertically for accountability. And we've been mapping out this uh, performance system. And like most fractals, they obey some simple rules. So our simple rules was that every higher level of the organization had to create a structure, a table, that every lower level component of the organization is there, and they they make sure there's an infrastructure at each of those levels to improve quality. Now, the size of the infrastructure varies, but they all have to be uh, connected. So here's a uh, framework of a paper that Jill Marsteller and I wrote in the Journal of Health Outcomes Management. But I hope you can get this idea of cascading where we have a health system level. And this, you could put ambulatory, but hospitals is easy. Hospital levels where now all the hospital leaders are together within a hospital then cascading down to all the departments, within the departments, all the divisions and, and units, and literally having this hardwired so there's a scaling up and down, but most importantly, a forum for peer horizontal learning so that you really draw the power of the wisdom with, uh, within our clinicians. And we organize this complex, massive work into four streams because we, to give an example, report 275 measures of quality to external agencies, right? Think about how does any business manage that degree? And we now have 9% of our revenue at risk for those measures. Our margin is somewhere around three and a half, four percent right? So more than double your margin. We can't afford not to get this right. But managing 250 measures, I mean, you can imagine it's an enormous task uh, across all of our diverse systems. So we organize the work. And yet, when we ask our clinicians, what are you most worried about? None of those measures come up, or very few of them. They're worried about things that aren't measured. They're cultural things, or creating a culture of respect and speaking up. So we needed a different way of looking at it. So we organize our work into patient safety, which are almost all internal risks, things that go bump in the night. And we group those into, very simply, risky providers. And we can go through this analysis of how we find those risky units and then ri risky systems. Let me give you an example of risky units that we did because we linked basic and applied researchers. Many of our Bloomberg scientists, our sociologists, our psychologists, were looking at data to show there's some evidence that units that are low on engagement, that are low on patient satisfaction, and that are low on safety culture seem to have a much higher mortality and cost than other units. In other words, the unit itself is sick, and this is some data from the UK. But we never proactively identified those units. So we ran that analysis, again, fairly sophisticated. And then we sent the leaders where that unit maps to a memo that said, dear Dr. X, your unit was identified as a risky unit by this analysis. Here's the data. Here's how we did it. And I'm going to come schedule a meeting with you because these data are going to be publicly presented to our board in a month. And you can be rest assured they're going to ask what we're going to do about it, and I want to make sure you have a credible story that you can say that you look 
that you, that you look good. The point here, though, is the board gives us the cover that we're a supporting enabling rather than we're coercing. And every one of the chairs loved it. They made you changes. Almost all of them were a leadership change that needed to be had. And two of the chairs who were really senior said, you know, Peter, thanks for doing this. I knew I needed a change, but I needed some cover, but I didn't have any of the data or the science. So that's one category. Second category is performance on external measures. That's these 9%, these 275 things that are growing every year that there's a whole infrastructure to measure. Next is patient experience. And finally, uh, it's value, which is our work for quality over cost. That is these other measures that are really are measures of quality, like mortality, infections, as well as how we're driving out uh, costs. So here's just an example of how we organize this. This is in that ambulatory practices d domain, where they report up to our, our board quality committee. They now have their own quality council that every one of our primary practice groups is now represented, didn't exist before this. They organize their work into these four categories. The measures vary between inpatient or pediatrics or our, our ambulatory procedure, but the framework is the same, so it allows us all to communicate. And, and then here's the different people all at the table. So we don't get rebellion because everybody co-creates this structure. Well, there was, you will create this. This was top down. There will be a forum, but most people loved being at the table. And now we have this mantra that Pete, we we're doing it with all these stakeholders rather than, than uh, to them. We're also working very much to standardize our work. That was um, not something that, that Hopkins did very well. And what fundamentally what we're trying to tease out is differentiating or encouraging mindful variation and diminishing mindless variation. So mindful variation is what Scott or Anthony Rosen's talking about. That is you vary because you have a hypothesis or you have some theory or even just a hunch of why you're going to do something. But that mindful variation implies an obligation to learn. You have to collect data. Much of our variation, though, is mindless variation. It's variation because I have power, because I want to, because it's the way I've always done it. And we need to dramatically dampen down mind less variation and encourage mind uh, full uh, variation. A few examples of some of how this model is uh, working at Johns Hopkins. I mentioned this safety that we don't have great measures of safety because you don't measure them in rates typically. It's a big flaw. But there are methods that we borrowed from NASA and APL and others of what's called the safety case. So example. So you probably read in the, pre in the press we had this um, endoscope problem that was infecting a lot of people. Prior to this structure, we would have no idea where we're doing endoscopes even, but we now had a team working on it. We sent out a message. They all did this standard risk assessment. We started being up quite uh, risky. We implemented some changes, dramatically reduced. As you probably saw, we lost number one in U.S. News and World Report, and we have a lot of money at risk for these patient safety indicators. You could argue how valid they are clinically. Um, Sydney and others are studying th that there's large variation in their validity, but that said, we still have to play to the test. We put this process in and have now about a 70%, a 37% improvement over two years uh, in, in a row. Our patient experience scores, um, we frankly weren't a major focus of our of our efforts. They're now are publicly re reported and, and using this star rating, but we're seeing the needle move on virtually all of our hospitals applying the same disciplined approach, same framework of declaring your goals, creating an enabling infrastructure, connecting and engaging clinicians in peer learning communities, and transparently reporting. Uh, your results, those same structures that allowed hospitals to get to zero clabsy, that science is informing how we're organizing it. Our value work is where some of the most breathtaking stuff that's happened in, and it's through these what we're calling clinical communities. You see, when we looked and we partnered with our anthropologists and our qualitative researchers of why this clabsy project, the bloodstream project, spread. What they said is, Peter, we hate to burst your bubble, but it probably wasn't the checklist, or the checklist may have been very minor point. 
what it was, this was much more of a sociologic intervention, that clinicians started telling a new story, that they used to tell a story that harm is inevitable and I'm not empowered to do anything about it. And through this, they told a story that harm is preventable and I could do something about it. And we dug into the sociological literature and find out, well, what leads to that change? What There's really clear data that there's two key attributes that are essential. One is someone believes that you can improve, right? So that someone really uh, is saying, yes, this is hopeful, we're able to do this. And the second is you create a structure where people feel they belong. That is, they're connected. And when we looked at how we did this, when we started this project, we spread it state by state. And in each state, we invited all the hospitals to come in to share learning. And the first half of the sessions were like a revival, right? They were not sharing how good Hopkins was, which was a very key strategy, but they were sharing, look what you're capable of doing. We believe in you. And those of you who are clinicians know, much of our life is spent getting beat down and told no. And, and so this believing in them was, was novel. And they learned, they created a forum for peer learning. So we started applying and we called those peer learning clinical communities. And we use these clinical communities as a framework across Johns Hopkins Medicine. They all are led most by a physician, but not, not, not all by clinicians. They all are required to have an academic and a community division lead because our community docs in the beginning felt that we were quite arrogant and they were right and we were the ones who were smart doctors and we were imposing things on them and it was never gonna work. And we've had several physicians who had to be, who said, Peter, I'm the world's expert in X, I don't want a community co-lead. Um, I'm going to lead this community. And we'd say, well, then you're not going to lead it. You either get an academic, I mean, a community co-chair or I'll get somebody else. I don't care that you're the world's expert. You won't be able to scale outside of your own practice if you don't have this philosophy of collaboration. So we now have, and they're supported by this analytics framework that is nowhere near as mature. But what we found is to make this work, we had to break down silos because there was the finance people who had one set of data. There are the people who can get data out of the EMR. There are people who had quality data and they never talked to each other. And not only did they not talk to each other, they had silos. So there was no front end for clinicians to say, I need access to X for, for value. And us build a structure. We said, that's not your job to go know, oh, Sue gets this data and Joe gets this data. Oh, well, no, he can't give it to you that way. That as an organization, we had to build an infrastructure that if you want this, you should be able to come and, and get it. So we broke down these silos and we created a project management office, but essentially it's that same enabling infrastructure that allowed us to get to zero infections. It has robust project management. It has clinical analytics and it has safety scientists. And we merge or link the academic people with operations to draw upon a variety of different uh, um, sciences. Here's some of the current clinical communities uh, that we have. And this is one of the few things that are a pull rather than a push. In other words, the rate limiting step of us creating this is how much infrastructure we have. We have a list of about 60 of these people who want to form these communities. And I'll give you an example. I was called the other night by Spiritual Care who said, we want to form a clinical community. And I said, that's great, but you don't need my blessing. Just like go call the other people who do spiritual care around our health system and get together and start walking. And they said, no, 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 no. We really want to be part of this bigger thing. We want to be branded a clinical community and, and be, be part of this. And I think because this philosophy of doing things collaboratively with rather than two people. Here's some examples of what we're doing in this community. There's a great dealing of evidence of variation in transfusion and that we probably shouldn't transfuse blood unless your hemoglobin is seven or eight, but you can see enormous variation. So we presented this data back and saw a pretty significant reduction, but even more magical, we started linking these communities together. So our orthopedic surgeons doing hip and joint replacement never knew of this evidence that you don't need to transfuse at a hemoglobin of seven. When they were trained, they used a hemoglobin of 10. So almost overnight, we eliminated transfusions in these practices by connecting these various uh, communities. We took in our uh, hip and knee replacement $2,000 off about 25% of our costs. Uh, 
and in part of this, it was really magical. Our finance folks were working on a supply chain initiative, but they, to make supply chain work, you have to get the docs to agree on what supplies they're going to use. You can get some improvements from negotiating with the vendors, but that's about 15% of the savings. But they couldn't get the clinicians to come to the table. So we said, okay, part partnership, I'll partner with you, but under two conditions. One is that clinician choice is maintained. We're not going to take it away from them because that our whole communities are built on trust. But they'll make those tr decisions fully aware of what the cost savings are. And two, they get a piece of the savings. Now, it can't go back to their pockets, but it could go back to registries or investments in analytics or quality improvement that they want. And we agreed, and we're driving out costs. Their patient experience, when we put this up, uh, improved some dramatic results in colorectal surgery where they took their infection rates from 27 and everybody said oh when you cut the bowel there's stool in it you can't get your infection rates down now they're at four percent i mean really just just um remarkable i want to now kind of end with where are we struggling or what might we do and what did we learn about this well first is in order to get this clinical and researchers or operations and researchers together, it takes a whole lot of work. In doing this work, let me give you an example. In the Institute, we have 18 different disciplines from every school in the university in the applied physics lab. But for that to work, we invented our own version of Moore's Law, you know, Moore's Law about the computer speed doubles, and that is the amount of time required to manage relationships goes up exponentially with the number of different disciplines involved. Because what we learned is that I think our academic training is not training people to be a learning healthcare system. Because for us to work together, you, I literally needed to learn 18 different languages. I didn't need to be an expert in them, but I can't communicate with a systems engineer if I'm not humble enough or committed enough to say I, can, I need to understand your language, how you think about I issues, what you're doing, it, or an anthropologist or an ethnographer. And likewise, those groups need to understand some basic of, of the clinical. But our training largely makes us BTs, as you all know. That is, the traditional model is you have deep methodological grounding in one discipline and very little knowledge of anything else. And what I think we need to do is be more like a jellyfish. And that is you need one long methodological grounding. I think you need to do good science in something, but you need many, many short tentacles. And so our training, I think, needs to largely be more of a spoken hub where I can have one you know, epidemiology or biostats or, or psychology, but then draw from informatics or systems engineering across the university so I could speak and collaborate with, with, with the, these people. But the key to making this work is not the technical pieces. It's not, do you know proteomics or genomics? It's what we call the adaptive side. How do you get people to buy into this? How do you get culture change? And the number one lesson that I learned, it was interesting because I thought it was something novel until my sociology colleagues told me, Peter, this is like 60 years old data. And that is, when you're dealing with professionals, things done to them rather than with them are highly resisted they're never implemented locally and if they do they don't work and so all these structures are designed to bring people in to co-create things now that doesn't mean we don't have a purpose right i we use the metaphor that in this work we are unwavering in the hill we climb but humble enough to invite everybody to climb it and this balance between interdependence and independence is key because we can't take a thousand years either because we're still spending a lot of money and people are dying but we have a form now to make uh, de decisions and then some more subtle things that in part of our leadership training or culture change always making sure that we use language that implies power with rather than power over people let me give you a subtle example say i'm introducing dr rosen for a talk and as often happens at sessions, you'll see, I say, no, I'm going to let Dr. Rosen speak now, right? Power over Dr. Rosen. He feels fundamentally different if same amount of time, say, boy, are you in for a treat? Our next speaker is Dr. Rosen, and he's got this brilliant concept of precision measurement. Dr. Rosen, right? 
much more likely to collaborate with him. Or I'm meeting with someone, I'm trying to understand their disciplines and meet with them, and my conversation says, okay, it's great, I'm going to let you go now, right? Implies power over them. Because these, these collaboratives are really sensitive to the relational aspects. And we need people who are really transformational leaders, but sensitive to the... Um, so have high social IQ so you can make these dynamics work. And when you get them to work, they're magical. But if they, you don't have these kind of leaders, they stumble and they, they fumble and they, they don't go uh, particularly uh, well. So being mindful of that adaptive leadership. Where we're struggling and where I'd love to explore further are really two key issues. One is, or m m maybe th three issues. One is... Uh, getting better precision measurement. So I think as Dr. Rosen and I and Scott have been noodling around, we use this term of you know precision medicine, and I, I I don't think that's enough. And we've too narrowly defined it as measuring people's genes. But as you hopefully saw, genes are one part of a larger system that you need to measure phenotypes and care processes and organizational characteristics, and all of those need to go into this system. And we need accurate measures. At, e at each of the, those areas, and, and we're not there uh, yet, or even in the mindset that we need to do that. Second is we need to do better methodologies that, I, and I fully admit, much of the work that we've done here uh, often lacks control groups. I think we can much more easily do more controlled studies. We could do more ongoing cohort studies, as we talked about this morning, likely do some cluster randomized things so that we learn what's working or, or not so that we could actually improve and, and, uh, and uh, apply it in a more systematic way. And then finally, we need a more robust analytics platform that right now, it is just way too hard to get data out of these, these uh, systems. And I think the US healthcare system was misguided, or perhaps they were sold a bill of goods in thinking that that platform is the EMR. Right, and you know they were putting in Epic, as you know, and it's probably the best that's out there. But it's it's built on an archaic data system that is never going to allow the flexibility that you need. That we believe you, there needs to be a platform that is open that sits on top of not just the EMR, but but a variety of sensor data or survey data. That then you have open API apps that you could write things to. So the vision, or at least the vision that that I believe is going to be much more like Salesforce. If you think what makes Salesforce unique is they have an open API platform and they only allow open API apps to run on them. So anything can be connected and you can control who has users to what. We built a program called Topaz uh, that we're using now in one of our ICU products, the university owns it, that is that exact same open architecture, open API. But I think unless we get the platform that right this learning health system is going to be incredibly in, in, incredibly arduous. So in closing, what I'd say to you is that through history, we see when we could break the silos between pure research and applied or between operations and research, we can create the kind of energy and productivity that Bell Labs had or that Pasteur had or that allowed us to do the moonshot. And I believe deeply that Johns Hopkins is the best university to be able to do this because much more than any of our colleagues, we actually collaborate together. And we have you know, people working with public health and engineering and APL and medicine and nursing all work, working together. And I think the onus is on us to be able to take what this little girl's mom asked us and say is now could we tell her that besides Josie King not being likely to die anymore, that her and all the different reasons people are dying needlessly, we have an answer for them. And I, and I think Hopkins is, is the place to do it. So thank you. And, uh... um, I, I think it, it, it would be interesting to, uh, to think a minute in a way that could bring at the patient interface oh. level all the things you're talking about, Peter, and how to improve the patient and family experience, and ask, what does in health do, hmm. you know, to this picture? Because I'm sure it's very naive, but I I think of um, 
often peter when you are talking about how do you help health care organizations reliably deliver effective interventions right you know it's sort of all about this and why you're and you often begin by standardizing right and you're standardizing in order to reduce complexity and reduce the risk for error. But in health, in many ways, you may be standardizing, but it's at a subpopulation <coughs> level. So I could see at the interface of delivering care, everything that we're doing in, in health as adding enormous complexity to this patient, probably all the boxes, right. but just focusing right now on the patient experience box. If you look like, for ex one example I love that you talk about is um, when you have um, changes of nursing shifts, um, having the patient and the family right present at the handoff as as what needs to happen at that handoff is communicated. Right. It's it's a wonderful example of very tangibly thinking about the patient and the family as part of the care team. Right. And 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 now that families can be with patients 24/7, you know, at Hopkins, this you know, this <coughs> learning to communicate is right. is 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 getting more and more challenging in many ways, although you're introducing a lot of tools you know, right. to help that. But could, could, Scott, would you be willing to say, no, you're all wet and this, this isn't gonna happen at all? Do you see where you're going, uh, where the in-health community is going as introducing more complexity? So, so I think uh, Peter's uh, analogy of the fractal is uh, important to answer your question. So there's two levels, uh, there's many levels, a continuum of levels at which you can think of the problem. But, but at each level, the idea is to, is to know as much as possible about how to be effective. So at the patient interface with the clinician, um, knowledge is what enables the clinician to advise the patient and the patient's family about the optimal choice. And, and, and that knowledge comes from system discovering what's best about this person, but all, you know, and, and, and then to organize itself to make sure that the best thing gets to that person. So, so I think there's analysis at the system level, and careful analysis is going to produce better um, procedures and better outcomes. And I think your simplicity could be one of the features of a system that's Value. But then there's also analysis at the individual level to make sure that what we're offering this person works for them. So let me just give an example at the individual level. So when a man is diagnosed with prostate cancer, uh, especially early on, there's about a 50% chance, at least for the Hopkins patients, about a 50% chance that that prostate cancer is indolent. So imagine the experience of the patient there in their family, there's a new diagnosis. It's a life, potentially a life-threatening uh, disease. Uh, there are many procedures that can be done. You can have surgery and radiation, or you can sit and just watch carefully what's happening. And, and uh, in the past at Hopkins, we would give the choice largely of surgery or radiation, right? And, and if you're a patient, you know, you, you are scared. You're, you think your life is threatened, so you tend to want to act. So I think the simple thing is, oh, I know how to do this. You can take a very much of a, of a power relationship. I know how to do this, we're gonna do surgery. And the patient would usually say yes. But now we know that about 50% of those tumors are indolent, that is to say, if you do nothing to them, you get the best health outcome because the tumor doesn't threaten your life and the very serious consequences of surgery or radiation don't diminish the quality of your life. But you need information to figure out whether the person's in the indolent category or the uh, uh, lethal category. So that requires better measurements, right? So we need to make better measurements of it, and in absent those better measurements, which we need to develop, the right thing to do probably is to follow the person forward and to continue to do surveillance. It's a bit more complex, you know, and perhaps there's a 
challenge that, but on the other hand, it's a much better procedure and it produces better outcomes at more affordable costs. So either at the system level or at the patient level, you need better data and better decision making that's informed by that data. And I agree that can increase complexity, but only um, in the short term. I think in the long term, once we know what's better, that's, that's actually the simpler because you get, you get better outcomes and people feel more that they can trust the system. Laura, I'll <clears throat> add on to that and give an example that I think is just such a uh, great vision for um, in health and, and it's, it's you know a, a program under that domain is we're doing this project called Emerge. But quite simply, if you think about it, we took one harm infection, central line infections, and made a checklist that had five items to reduce it. But we started brainstorming and saying, in part to this little girl's mothers, how many patient, how many harms is a patient with five chronic disease at risk for? Right, over a dozen. How many harms is your average hospitalized patient at risk for? Over a dozen. Every one of those harms has a checklist. Every checklist might have five or 10 things we're supposed to be doing. And many of those you're supposed to do three or four times a day, and no one's ever listed them. So you do the math, and we would literally, or a patient would be expected to do well over 150 things every day, far beyond our memory. Now you add genetic components, because there's some of those people of either genetic variation would even make it go up another log order or, or exponentially because there's, if you have this genotype, you may metabolize anticoagulations at this uh, other stage. And so the in health without technology or decision support could introduce, we could introduce complexity, but we're also not, our brains aren't doing it well now. So I think coupling that data with tools to help um, clinicians make sure that they could then apply that tool it's, it's why my point, without being cheeky, is we can't just be a learning, it has to be improving, or it's not just being curious, it has to be committed that we need that interplay, because otherwise, you're right, the risk is we just add a lot of new noise without making sure patients benefit from it. So my most important role here is to try to get all of us uh, uh, involved in the discussion, and I'm, I'm wondering what Yes. So, hi, my name is Mary. I work on the health system, and I'm lucky enough to work with Scott on InHealth. And I just wanted to underscore um, two points, and you asked, what is InHealth doing? So you kind of move some of these agenda, critical agenda items forward. You know, what we do on the health system side is um, we, make, we manipulate the environment, and we uh, make changes to the context within which patients get care. But we do call it quality improvement. And we call it quality improvement for a couple reasons. One, it gets us out of the you know, um, long you know, approval process necessary for IRB approval, et cetera, but we don't really randomize. And so we, we uh, read articles ba you know, based by our academics and we institute changes. And then if they work, we keep funding them year on year. But we can never really actually say whether the intervention caused the change, only that it's moving in the right direction. So really what this conversation is doing, in conversations with Scott and with Faye and with Peter and others is, Really, what is our responsibility as health plans? We have an accountability here. Now that we know, that's really not good enough for, it, for us to continue to do that. So um, we are working with Ruth and others and forming advocacy groups within our patient population and really getting their feelings as to how would you feel about participating in research if in fact you knew that your children and your children's children would one day benefit from this type of thing. So that's, that's one area that's already having an impact and I did want to mention something. Peter talked about creating an enabling infrastructure. And I, I, this is such a critical uh, point. I actually did my dissertation on it, and Scott's statistics helped me get pretty uh, good feedback on it. But I, this is a natural experiment that took place right here at Johns Hopkins. So we have a primary care clinic, and at the time there was 28 primary care sites, now there are 35. But at one point, right around 2003, that group went from being paid capitated, where they were fully responsible for the care of the population, to they were then paid um, basically fee for service. And my company took on the financial risk. So think of it, pri primary care practice, patient population stayed the same, case mix of the population stayed the same, benefits did. The only thing that changed was the mothership, president of that company knew that they were not capitated. So they only really focused on the primary care. And so it was unbelievable, and I worked there, so I know the deal. And even having worked there, there were so many changes to the environment 
that were designed to either promote restraint or, or promote intervention. And they essentially flipped when the payment methodology flipped and we were able to show huge changes in interventions based on the, um, the financial model of the primary care group. So, you know, we, we, all have, we do have the ability, Scott mentioned, one of the great things about Hopkins is we have populations, and we have patients, and we've got the applied physics side, so we have the elements to actually execute on some of these incredible principles that Peter's talking about and, and in health is focused on. Just one thing. Um, I'll go <coughs> to Laura's point about the complexity. And um, one, one, of the, one of the key issues, I think, with many of the technologies that are available is that uh, the complexity is enormous. If you're measuring every gene in the genome, every protein in the proteome, um, the potential complexity that you're introducing to the system is, is enormous. And if you look at what um, emerged has now, or even the, the, the checklist for the central line that's um, they didn't go for a thousand brands. They went for several <coughs> nodes, which were really important. And they were with kind of fixation that they could, when you take on a, a small checklist and you're sure that you're doing the right things, you can knock many of these things out of the way. And so one of the issues I think for for in health is I don't think in health's um, concept is to use the genome and to use the proteome and to use absolutely every piece of data that <coughs> you can, but it's really to identify these really important nodes that have large effects and to knock out large effects one another. And I think that's the difference between what's what's um, Scott's proposing in in health compared to many of the other things and that other programs that are out there. And I think that the, the idea that that through this progressive definition of of um, a possum, really parsimonious data set that identifies subgroups um, that you will actually be able to operate this in, in a system that you would never be able to do if you, if you take everything you can possibly measure. So figuring out what to measure, the small number of things to measure that really make a difference is, is, is one of the key um, challenges. You know, Anthony, and that's a really brilliant and insightful point because in retrospect, when we made our checklist, we went to the CDC guideline and it recommended 95 interventions to prevent and didn't prioritize which ones are most important. And we, because we had people trained in Clinepi, we literally sat down and said, which ones have the lowest number needed to treat and which ones have the lowest risk or cost? And that's how we arrived at just five. And we said, it's not practical to do 90. But that kind of calling down or imparting wisdom, I think, is going to be key to making this all work. Um, I, I just want to go back to your one point about, um, you know, it sounds like standardizing processes within the healthcare system is a, is a good answer to reducing cost and variability in, in outcomes of care. And I think one of the um, topics that comes up is standardization <coughs> and its creativity to a certain extent. And I'm wondering how you kind of approach that way of, you know, choosing what processes to standardize. And I think you mentioned that briefly. And if you could maybe um, expand on that. Yes, yeah, so you're absolutely right. So there's um, a, a whole field of safety called resiliency engineering that is premised on the idea that standardizing introduces risks because you there's a lot of e effort taken to do that, and the, it may not fit the individual um, patient, so it's clearly a balance. Uh, that decision is largely made by local clinicians. We don't pretend to do that centrally. What, what we tee up, like for example, we have an effort now in, to get cost and variation out of 10 surgical product lines. So we work with leaders from each of those surgeries. They use this framework, but they tap into their wisdom about what makes sense to standardize and, and what doesn't. We support them with you could think of as a methodologist or someone who knows about implementation science to think through uh, the risks and benefits of, of doing these. And a final point is it's often not that the standardization is bad, 
but that you don't know when you need to deviate from that, right? Or creating a, a culture that it's okay, this is, yes, this is a principle that I'm supposed to go by, but in this case, it doesn't make sense and I'm gonna do what's right for the patient and, and, and vary. And we're working to get that balance. It's, as you could imagine, it's, uh, it's tough. The clinicians also really resonate with this. It, it sounds cheeky, but mindful and mindless variation, because uh, we really want mindful variation so that we learn but that's not most of what we have. Sure. Um, I was gonna ask, it's more of a general question, but let me take a specific example. Like Dr. Zeger mentioned about prostate cancer, and I know part of the health program is actually looking at that specific question. <coughs> um, there's times where you'll find these important nodes and the data will show that something's clearly a better way to treat patients or um, and I think when you share that with your clinicians and, you know, they're motivated to uh, work with you on that, that if they believe that it will improve the quality of their patients' lives, that's a feasible change to make. But for prostate cancer, for example, that's more of a trade-off. There's some values built into that decision where you decide to screen less aggressively or to choose a logical rating over surgery. There is a trade-off in terms of, yes, quality of life is affected by surgery, but you are taking a small risk even though over 50% of patients that use the set for Hopkins um, will have indolent cancer. There will be a few patients who will have aggressive disease, and it's hard to tell the difference. So I guess my question is, how do you then, and you mentioned Dr. Provost, that's not command and controls and how you inspire clinicians to change, it has to come from collaboration. How do you change that mindset where the number one concern usually for a clinician seeing a cancer patient is survival, mortality, and everything else is secondary, to really get them to adopt a different framework of thinking about quality of life and being able to accept that risk or have that conversation with the patient. Well, one, one thing I can tell you is that Val Carter, who's the uh, clinician who runs this uh, active surveillance cohort, 1,300 men at Hopkins, has just uh, joined the, uh, with the in health group, received a PCORI uh, grant, and the purpose is to take the prediction tools we now have. What, what we can do, do now is integrate complex data of multiple sources to be able to make our best estimate of the person's chance of having an indolent cancer. Actually, CarpTech is working on this. And uh, uh, so with that information, you know, that, that's, that's sort of a technical step forward. But now the question is, how does a patient and a doctor use that to allow the patient's preferences to emerge and, and to be balanced against what the risks are? So it, it, unless you have some sense of what the risks are, it's hard to balance them, right? So now we have a measure of the risk, we can learn how to communicate that. And in fact, what he, Dr. Carter, has done is recruited uh, three of his patients in the active surveillance group to be co-investigators on that project. And their, their job is to try to develop a communication tool that will enable the patients themselves, their families, and their doctors to look together at what the evidence is and, and how it's progressed. It changes over time. So, you know, as you come into the next visit, you can have already seen what the evidence is and then can sit down with your doctor and try to get what's best for you. And I would certainly agree, I think, with your point that it, what's best for one person isn't best for every person. That's the whole notion of individualized health, that we want to try to do what's best for each individual in their unique circumstances and Preferences. You know, I, I would just add to that, Scott, that um, though we were talking a lot about as this is quantitative, you know, in looking at spreading these things, it's as important to know whether something worked uh, as it is to know how and why, and that's often social science uh, researchers. So, you know, on your point, there's some uh, great political science work that suggest that in these decisions, we think we're very analytic and, and it's a quantitative decision, but we're much more emotional that certain words force us to feel a certain way and then we select facts to make us feel or to support that that feeling. So not being mindful of, of those words that might trigger or understanding that clinician's thought process or the patient's barriers is, you know, is, is you'll be do doomed to failure because it's not just, you know, here's my regression model go do this, it's understanding what are you afraid of and, and, um, and being very mindful of those words that you use. I worked with Dr. Carter on the battle uh, I worked on the AUE guidelines, so we had a few triggers poked in our chest at the annual meeting after releasing the less aggressive screening guidelines. So it's a mm -hmm. communication challenge that I'm very glad that you're working on. And one thing I'd also say is what I, what I love about this, this seminar and this whole field is that it really is the 
marriage of public health and medicine and nursing. And, and I, I gave a talk at Stanford this last month called Individualized and Population Health, two sides of the same coin, because you, you can't do what Peter's doing without taking a population perspective. So that the benefit for the patient requires that that patient be embedded, be seen within the context of a population of outcomes. And similarly, you can't improve a population's health unless you improve the health of the individual patients. So in, you know, finally, you know, this is the chance for public health and medicine to actually work together. And you see that in Peter's teams. You know, he has the, the range of expertise from <coughs> clinicians in, in, interested in particular patients all the way through population and organizational health. And, and then the methodologists and the different disciplines that help inform that, that uh, uh, trajectory from population to patient. Right? So I think it's a very exciting time. And, it, you know, and, and from the perspective of the School of Public Health, you know, we, for, for our history, have been providing methodology to East Baltimore to try to strengthen uh, the quality of care at the individual patient level as well. Well, the, the methodologies we need now are different methodologies and emerging. I think we want the School of Public Health to shape itself in ways to be able to be responsive to the needs of the, of the patients in our health system. Getting the right data and then the analytical tools to, to use it are, um, are actually big challenges. And I wonder if you had any ideas about what, what the solutions are there. Uh, yeah, I, um, I believe the EMR will be a transaction system. You'll enter data and it might do some simple decision support tools or drug allergy firings, it's not going to do this. It, this doesn't have the capability, and it's an incomplete data set. Um, our strategy to move beyond that has been threefold. Uh, one is to work with the regulators and policymakers to require that the vendors open up APIs, and the new meaningful use looks like it's moving in that direction, and really saying, you know, we spent $19 billion, and the empiric evidence is we haven't gotten much out of it that you could accelerate that by requiring them to open the APIs. Two is to create demand amongst uh, provider organizations that purchase these to say, we're not gonna buy anymore unless you have open APIs. And, you know, my sense is we probably overspent for what we, the value we get by a lot, one or two lag orders. I mean, not a, a little bit way overspent. And we bought these things with no demands that they talk to each other and we've accepted that, you know, which is, you know, um, Alan says he makes the metaphor that it would be like Boeing's building a plane and as you know they subcontract to a thousand vendors and the maker of the landing gear was to say to Boeing I'm not going to send a signal to the cockpit to tell you if the landing gear is up or down that's my data you can't have it and Boeing says oh that's okay no, you know planes will crash and people will die but if you don't want to give us that data not a problem and that's the way we buy technologies and then the third strategy is through uh, high value demonstration projects like Emerge, where the, the value of when you do this is just so high face validity that it furthers, accelerate those first two other, that, that first two strategies. So I think there's a lot of momentum in this. What's missing is that, that is the high value demonstration projects, like, like the e infusion pump talking to the EMR. So, um, first of all, I want to thank everybody for participating. I know you're busy people and you have lots of things to do, but uh, please join me in thanking Peter and Laura for really wonderful stimulating.